All right, Genesis chapter 4. Listen, I'm going to read uh, 15 verses to us. Our focus today really is going to be uh, the second half of chapter 5 and verse, or sorry, the second half of verse 5 and then verse 6 and 7. But I want you to get the whole thing. So uh, remember with me, uh, at this point, Adam and Eve, very bad decision. They chose to eat from the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The consequences have been laid out to Adam, to Eve, and to the serpent. Um, And now we see that their family begins with much difficulty. The scripture says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, verse 1, chapter 4, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord which is what we all say when we have our first baby boy. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, I just want to reference uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. You can uh, go there later on. And because there's a big question, why was it? They both brought something to God. One brought from the fruit of the ground. One brought from the fruit of the flock. And one was accepted and the others wasn't. Was it because it was a grain offering instead of uh, uh, an animal sacrifice? Um, the, The book of Hebrews tells us that it was a matter of the heart, that Cain brought his... Uh, without regard to faith, Abel brought his in faith. And so because Abel brought his offering to the Lord in faith, his was accepted. Now, it's possible that it was brought in faith because he was following the pattern that God had established for the atonement of sin, which was the slaying of an animal. Uh, You remember when Adam and Eve sinned and they were in the garden, they clothed themselves with fig leaves Uh, That was insufficient, so God clothed them with tunics, which was the skin of an animal that had been sacrificed. So so, uh, nevertheless, Abel's was accepted and Cain's was rejected. The Bible goes on to say, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So there's an issue in his heart. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? Now we'll talk about this today. God knew full well what was going on in Cain's heart, but Cain did not and he was tempted to ignore it and God was drawing this issue out because it's not not good for us to ignore what's happening in our hearts. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, the very first time the word sin is used in the Bible. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now I just want to pause for a minute. Can you imagine this? Like, I mean, just put yourself in the position of Adam and Eve. You're in the, the glory and the beauty and the perfection of the Garden of Eden, You make the wrong decision, you choose to sin, and I think immediately, I know immediately, there was division in their relationship with God. Um, There was evidence around them that creation itself was fallen. Physical death was entering into the process, and now here among their, their, their two boys, their two sons, immediately there is the result, there is the manifestation of the problem that they started in the first place, in the very first family. Listen, this isn't just, I'm not not minimizing these things. This isn't just gossip or lying or, you know, a little bit of theft. All those things are bad. Don't get me wrong. This is murder, you know, among their first children. How horrifying this must have been for them. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Uh, Just P.S., don't be sarcastic to God, okay? That's your take-home truth today. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, 
which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, therefore, God is just so merciful Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Let's pray together. God, please, we pray today that you would manifest your saving power in this, in this place. God, that you would manifest your supernatural ability to break chains that exist within our lives. We believe you to be the living God. We believe you to be present in this moment. God, we believe you to be the only one who can meet the deep needs that exist within our hearts. And so, Father, I pray that we would find ourselves in a disposition of faith today, in a disposition of trust. God, that you would not only reveal what it is that needs that divine touch from you, but you would give us the strength to trust you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. All right, well, you notice today that the title of the message is The Chain Breaker. And so I just want to say to you on the front side, this is really good news. Are you ready for some really good news? Have you had a whole bunch of bad news this week? Has it just been like uh, just uh, one thing after another? Well, the good news is Jesus is the chain breaker. All right, there you have it. God bless you. Go in peace. I'm just kidding. We got a lot of work to do today. All right, he is the chain breaker. In fact, in the New Testament, there is a, a history of Jesus breaking physical chains in people's lives. I want to give you a couple of examples. You remember Jesus and his ministry to the man who was filled with legion of demons. Well, that man was totally out of control. He was bound with chains, and Jesus broke those chains in that man's life. I think about Peter as he had been preaching the gospel faithfully with the early church in the book of Acts, and there was that strong persecution against the apostles. You remember he was placed in prison. Herod had, had seen how it had pleased the multitude when he put James to death. Well, he thought he'd do the same thing with Peter. He placed him in prison. What happened? Jesus showed up via an angel, broke Peter's chains, opened up the prison door, and set him free. What did Peter do? He went to a prayer meeting, okay? So just an FYI, when he sets you free, go to a prayer meeting. I think about Paul and Silas. You remember Paul and Silas were in the depth of that jail in Philippi, the worst possible place they could be. They were locked in stocks, the Bible says. Okay, you know, I mean, those aren't necessarily physical chains, but they essentially do the same thing. And well, what were they doing? They were praying and they were singing hymns. And as they were praying and singing hymns, what did Jesus do? He broke the stocks, he broke the chains, and he opened those prison doors. There is... There is evidence of Christ in the New Testament breaking physical chains, but the truth is this, most of us aren't dealing with physical chains in our lives, we are dealing with spiritual and emotional chains. Chains maybe that have been passed on, and I'm going to explain this in a, in a minute, chains that have been maybe passed on from generation to generation. I'm talking about patterns of sin. You know, we know that that's the case. As we look at Adam and Eve and as we consider the very first family and we see the conflict in their life, uh, the conflict among their kids that led to murder, uh, how did that possibly happen? Well, we know that Adam, through Adam and Eve, there was a sin nature that was passed into Abel and Cain, and it was manifested in a horrendous way in Cain's life. Paul says this, Paul says, through one man, sin has entered Humanity, we're all born with this sinful nature. Hey, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish I could say to you today, put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and you will never deal with the struggle of sin or temptation again. But that's just not the case. I mean, we know it's not the case. If it was the case, the, per the church would be a perfect place. Okay, you chew on that one for a while. We wait for heaven. Heaven is gonna be the perfect place. All right, so we have a sin nature that we have to deal with, but listen, there's also behavior in our lives. 
It's not just that we're born with a nature, but that nature, that old nature uh, for us as Christians manifests itself through our attitude and our behavior. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we are we sin because we're sinners, right? We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. There's a manifestation of something happening within our lives. And this is a narrative in the book of Genesis. You know, sometimes it's easy, I think, for this narrative to get lost in the details of history. But what we see in the book of Genesis is this proliferation of sin, You know, it starts in Adam and Eve's life. It's manifested in Cain's life, but then it goes on from there. I mean, we just get six chapters in the book of Genesis, and the Bible says the whole world is corrupted by sin to the extent, right? I mean, just six chapters in. It's like a Petri dish. You guys ever do that bacteria experiment in high high school where you take the bacteria just a couple of cells, you place it on that wax in a Petri dish, you set it aside for a day or two, you come back and the whole dish is covered in that bacteria. Well, that's what happened in the book of Genesis. It started with one person's sin, one person's deception, and it proliferated to the extent where corruption and violence was covering the face of the earth. And God himself said, I've got to start over. I'm going to start all over with Noah and his family. What is that? Well, listen, that is the real problem that we deal with today, not just manifested in the generation of Noah. You know, you get to Noah's life post-flood. What's Noah doing? Well, he finds himself in a condition of drunkenness. Abraham had an, had an issue with shaping the truth and lying that was passed on to Jacob. You look at the situation of Sodom and Gomorrah, or maybe Joseph's brothers selling him into slavery. The real problem today is the problem of sin. Make no mistake about it. Whatever issue we may be dealing with in our culture, I'm just going to name a few today that are kind of sitting at the top. Maybe it's misogyny. Maybe it's uh, racial inequity. Uh, Maybe it's advancing political causes at the expense of the unity of the nation and being able to actually move forward in a coherent, rational way. At the root of those things is the real problem, and the real problem is sin, right? You should know this. But I have great news for you today. I have great news for you today. The solution is found in the Word of God. And in fact, the solution is the Word of God. It is the Logos. It is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the chain breaker. He is the chain breaker in your life. I have great news for you today. Dysfunctional tendencies, toxic attitudes, generational consequences can all be broken by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say that, I say that today knowing full well that some of us struggle with what's been passed on from generation to generation in our family. Now listen, when you think about uh, the, 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 the reason why sin runs so deep, and it does run deep, right? We're not just talking about shallow issues here. We're talking about sometimes generational issues. When you talk to Christians about the reason why sin runs deep, in some Christian circles, you'll you'll hear people say, well, that's the case because of generational curse. Anybody hear of the generational curse before? You hear, hear about that? Wow, this congregation a lot less than the first one. You guys are more biblical, more theologically astute. Well, there are some people who say that there are generational curses that are passed on from generation to generation. It kind of goes like this. They say sin is caused by an evil spirit who has the power to harass the descendants of a particular person so that they're therefore prone to commit a certain sin, that there's some demonic spiritual inheritance that connects themselves, that connect themselves to that individual and in fact to their nature. And they get there by misinterpreting Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, where the Bible says this, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. 
And so these people would say, well, there it is. You know, you sin in your generation, and that produces a curse. There's a demonic connection, more than just an attachment, maybe even a possession. And you pass that on, that demonic influence, on to your kids. And so then they would say, well, you struggle with alcoholism, you have the demon of, of alcohol. You struggle with lust, you have the demon of lust. You struggle with gluttony or greed, well, you have the demon of gluttony, you have the demon of greed. And I want to say to you today, as someone who studied the scriptures, uh, that vernacular, that way of speaking about demonic influence is not found in the Bible. It's not found in the Bible. And you know what it ends up doing? It ends up putting us in a place where we're no longer responsible for our sin, Because we can say, hey, well, you know what? The demon made me do it, pastor. The devil made me do it. It's not really my fault. It's this demonic influence that's been passed on from generation to generation. There was a a guy years ago, we were at a men's conference, and he was wearing a shirt that said, the devil made me do it, (laughs) proudly, loud and proud. And my theology professor, who was a very aggressive guy, walked up to him and said, hey, you know what, big aggressive guy, your shirt is unbiblical. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? He's like, you can't blame your sin on the devil. You are responsible for your own sin. And the guy's like, you know what, you're right. And he ripped off his shirt right there. (laughs) And he spent the rest of the men's conference without a shirt on. Thank God it wasn't a woman's conference that this guy was at, (laughs) because that would have been another problem. But listen, this concept of generational curses is not found in the Scripture. It's not. Now listen, I'm going to talk today about how as parents we can create pathways. We can have behaviors in our lives that open the doorway for demonic influence. We're going to deal with this in the book of Genesis because you know that there are doorways that we can open to the adversary, even as Christians, that can influence our lives with demonic activity. I'm not talking about possession. I don't think that the Bible teaches generational curses. I do believe it teaches generational consequences. I do believe it teaches generational consequences. For one, we know that we have inherited a sinful nature. I've already talked about this this morning, a sinful nature that came through Adam. Well, that's passed on from generation to generation. We know that's true. We have a corrupt nature, right? We have an old nature. We have a fleshly nature. This is the way the Bible speaks of it. But in addition to that, family, sinful family, sinful patterns, patterns of sin in a family, I'll get this straight, you know? Patterns of sin in a family can be established and ingrained and therefore passed on from generation to generation. For instance, maybe it's drug abuse, maybe it's alcohol abuse, maybe it's abusive behavior, maybe it's a history of broken marriages, maybe it's living in spiritual poverty. There are behaviors, this is what I'm saying, there are behaviors that are uh, manifested, that are tolerated, and sometimes even presented as a value. And when we influence our kids that way with those things, they can get in their mind that these things are either good or they're just behaviors that they're stuck with just to be repeated from generation to generation. And not only that, but oftentimes these types of behaviors are housed in a toxic atmosphere, like in the family atmosphere. These types of ungodly sinful behaviors can be housed or maintained by manipulative behavior or a family atmosphere where people are driven by guilt or sometimes an obsessive focus on negativity, right? I mean, this is what kind of protects, in a negative sense, these behaviors from perpetuating in a family. And then they're forged like a link in a chain over the course of time. And you know what? It can be, become so accustomed to us. We can just become so used, like we're, we're marinating in this toxic atmosphere, this toxic family atmosphere, where this is just the way it is. And then over the course of time, pretty soon we find ourselves wearing these chains that we don't even recognize anymore. And it's not until there's a voice that speaks objectively to our hearts from the outside that there's even an awareness of these things existing within our lives. Listen, how do we get to that place? 
where those chains are broken in our lives. Sometimes, and I did this a couple of weeks ago, I make a joke out of it, you know, and honestly, it is funny, you know. Sometimes we find ourselves saying, hey, you know what, it's not my fault, it's the, it's the culture I was raised in. I made the mistake last week of using Italians as the example. My daughter-in-law is Italian, so, so I got in trouble when I got home. So sometimes we say, hey, I'm Irish, right? Or I'm Argentinian. I've got Latin blood coursing through my veins, and so I just have a predisposition, you know, to be a little fiery, you know, I make that joke, or, or, hey, you know what, pastor, I mean, it's just, it's my parents, you know, it's just been passed on to me from my parents, but the truth is, it's, it's not always funny, it's not always funny, because some of us are like, really, really, do I have to live with this for the rest of my life? You know what, you look at things that have been passed on from your parents or from generation after generation, and it's not a source of humor for you, it's a, it's a point of pain, you know, pain to the point where you almost feel hopeless, where it's like, man, this is just, this has so fully consumed my family for so long, I don't even see a way out. I don't even see light at the end of the tunnel. I don't see how there can be hope in this very dark situation. But I want to tell you today that there is hope for you. I want to tell you today that there is someone who can set you free. I want to tell you today, if you're a Christian, you live under the authority of someone who is greater than your parents or the behavior of your parents, or even the sin issue in your own life. Listen, this is what God does, and it's just so good. It's, he is so good. He guides Cain. He guides, Cain is not receptive. He's even sarcastic, I believe, to God. And yet God in his mercy sought to guide Cain through this very difficult situation, right? He navigates him. If you want to break the chain of generational consequences in your life, listen, if you want to start a new beginning in your life or in your family's life or even for generations to come, number one, you need to see the pattern. Number one, you need to see the pattern. Genesis chapter four says this, and I just want to start in uh, verse 5, the second half. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, right? I mean, this, God doesn't just let this go. God loves Cain enough to give him the revelation. Why are you angry? Why, Cain, why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? Cain, you know what? There's something happening in your life that you don't see. Now, listen, maybe, maybe Cain did see it. Maybe there was a tugging on Cain's heart by his conscience, but he was just resisting it. And so what did God do? God stepped in, and he revealed something to Cain that Cain himself probably did not see. Probably did not see. You know, it is not easy in our lives to acknowledge that, that sin is lurking in our hearts. We don't want to admit that. We don't want to acknowledge it. You know, like I said, um, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish I could say to you, hey, put your trust and faith in Jesus today. You'll never be tempted again. You will live a, a perfectly happy, holy life, and you will never sin. I wish I could say that to you today. But you know what? The reality of that is not going to happen until you get to heaven. Dear God, bring heaven as quickly as possible, right? I mean, it's just the old nature is a burden, it's a burden. This, the Bible, this is why the Bible says, put off the old nature. This is why the Bible says, crucify the flesh. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said it this way. He said, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In other words, this life I'm living, I see that old nature. There's sin that's lurking within it. It is in the very heart of who I used to be. And how am I dealing with it? Well, I'm not going to deal with it by ignoring it. It's not going to be by being passive. I can't just sweep this issue under the rug. God says, God says to Cain, handle it while it's in your heart. Handle it while it's in your heart. Listen, before this gets worse, and Cain is going to get worse, sin is crouching at the door. And before you go down the road of it manifesting itself in a way that you will forever regret Cain, while it's in the midst of your heart, deal with it. You know, where does sin start? Where does it start? Is it the act of adultery? Is it the act of fornication? Um, is, it the, the, is it right there in the midst of the divorce as conflict has not been resolved and you've come to an impasse 
and you're, you're ready just to, to go down the road of divorce. No, it happened a long time ago when it was lurking in the heart, which is when God desires us to deal with it. And the truth is, like I said, sometimes we don't even see it ourselves. We need that objective revelation that only God can bring. Hey, this is why we're in the Bible every weekend, okay? I mean, I could spend, I could spend 40 minutes talking about politics, but the truth is this, you've already heard 140 hours of it throughout the week, okay? <laughs> You've already heard 140 hours of politics, and politics isn't going to change your life or transform you or make you more like Jesus Christ. And so we open up the book, all right, and we, we deal with the truth of God's word. That's what we do. And while, while we do that, this is what God does. He speaks to us. He identifies areas in our lives that we are probably blind to ourselves, God is good enough through the working of his Holy Spirit because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Hey, if you can go to church week after week and it never hurt, you're probably going to the wrong church. It's got to hurt, right? No pain. <laughs> That's just the truth. And God will speak to us and he'll identify those areas. Thank God that he does that objectively, but it's not only God, it's other people in our life. You know, the people who you spend the most time with should have the greatest voice in your life because they know you better than anybody else does, like your spouse. <laughs> your spouse should have the greatest voice in your life because he or she knows you, right? They know you behind the closed doors. They know you when the facade is not on. They know when you're not out playing the game who you really are. And you know, it's in that relationship that oftentimes God brings the objective truth. Hey, babe, you know what? I just want to let you know that this area in your life probably really needs to be touched by the Lord. So instead of turning that dial off, instead of discounting what it is that your spouse says, your spouse should have the greatest opportunity of, of anybody in your life to speak truth to the heart. Now listen, spouse, when you do that, don't be belligerent. When you do it, don't be a nag, right? When you do it, don't be in the flesh. When you do it, when you're the one bringing the truth, don't just bring it because you want change to happen for your benefit. Do it because you want to see your spouse walk closer with the Lord. Yeah. So, so listen, it, it, couldn't have been, it couldn't have been clearer to Cain. Um, but listen, Cain was unwilling to change. There's two things today that I think of when I, when I think about seeing the pattern. Number one, you have to want to see it. You have to want to see it. And number two, you have to want to change it. You have to, you have, to have both those th things operating simultaneously for the chain to be broken in your life. David, the psalmist of psalmists, the king of Israel, he said this in Psalm 139, verse 23, "'Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me.'" Number one, God, I want you to show me. God, I want to know. I want to know. I acknowledge, God, there's a blindness in my, my life oftentimes that I justify and I, I, I code over. I see my life with rose-colored lenses. God, I need you to speak. God, I need you to show me the truth. As uncomfortable as it may be, I want you to show me. And Father, when you do show me, this is my commitment. I'm going to make the change. You know, the, the word that you speak to me is going to fall on fertile soil. I'm not just going to be a hearer of the word. I'm going to be a doer as well. I want to be led in the way that's everlasting. I want to make the change that you identify in my life, those things that need to be changed. Let me give you an example of this this morning. Some of us are just disposed to be, predisposed to be people of conflict. I mean, conflict follows us wherever we go. I mean, we're, you know, we're the person who is always creating the argument. We're always in the debate. We, we love to stir things up. If we look behind us, there's just a wake of dead bodies because we just regularly run people over. And you know, we're really bad at conflict resolution. How many of you guys today would say that you're really good at resolving conflict in interpersonal relationships? Raise your hand. Let me see. Let me see. All right. One. I'm counting today. Raise your hand high. 
Okay, be bold today. Be confident. All right, one, two, three, four, five. You're, you got to be confident. Don't just, t- there you go. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. You, some of you are like, this is a process for you. You're like, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. And your spouse is like, no, no, don't even do it. 14, 15, oh, check this whole section out over here. 16, 17, 18, 19, hey, spirit-filled section right over here. Okay, we got a couple late people in the back. Uh, right over here, Joe, come on, bro, you're from New Jersey. You don't handle conflict r- well. <laughs> I mess with you. <laughs> hey, listen, if you have conflict in your life, I'm going to give it to you, number one, right here. This is how you do it, okay? This is the the solution to conflict in your family. Let's have it. <laughs> Buy a puppy, okay? Because everybody loves a puppy. Look at you guys. I mean, you're the most manly man, and you're like, oh, can I hold her? This, by the way, is our new puppy. Her name's Ruby. She's cute. And we got no conflict in our family. I'm just kidding. You know, sometimes I, I do think it's very rare for us to, to uh, experience, you know, um, it's very rare for us to grow up in a family that handles conflict well. The truth is this, some of us, we just aren't equipped with the tools. And we grow up being exposed to people who handle conflict in a way where it's like, hey, I'm just gonna give that person the silent treatment or maybe I'm going to be passive aggressive, or maybe I'm the person that's like a a volcano ready to explode. And that's been the example that's been handed down to us that we've patterned ourselves after. I want to give you a couple of things this morning that I really do believe are amazing tools that will help you navigate conflict in your interpersonal relationships, okay? Here they are today, for real, here they are. Okay, now listen, all of this, the bookmarks, the bookends uh, on this are prayer. So above everything, listen, you got to pray, right? When you're in conflict, whether it's with your friends or church members or maybe in the workplace or with your spouse, with your kids, you got to be bathing the whole thing in prayer. Because before you even address the issue, your heart has to be right. And it's going to take just some time in prayer to get your heart right. Now, it can be a 10-second prayer. Like, God's got my heart right in 10 seconds. Maybe I've just got to get some space and really seek the face of God. I want to encourage you, by the way, we're going to go through this quick so you can take a picture of it. Um, But maybe you just got to get some space and go away with the Lord and uh, spend some time in prayer. But listen, when you're in the midst of conflict, when, when it's a difficult situation, maybe when there's been an offense, you need to, number one, handle it quickly. You need to, number one, handle it quickly. The more time you allow to transpire, the less likely you will be to address the issue. And and the problem with that is this, you will just perpetuate that. That will become a pattern in your life. Pretty soon, instead of being a person who actually addresses the issue, you just let the issues build up over the course of time until you yourself either break under the weight of it or you become explosive. Jesus said this to uh, his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, man, when you're in that place and you're worshiping and you remember while you're there worshiping that your brother has something against you, he didn't say, hey, just, you know, finish up what you're doing before God. You know, hey, just go ahead and offer the gift, you know, and let some time pass. He said, no, leave your gift. You guys know what he says? Leave your gift at the altar. Stop. Stop it. Go to your brother and be reconciled first, and then come back and offer the gift. Number one, because God does not want you worshiping in hypocrisy, right? So, so inner, unresolved interpersonal conflict can actually create a problem between ourselves and God. Number one, we handle it quickly because when we come into the congregation of God's people and we're singing to God, we don't want there to be unresolved issues in our life. It's not pleasing to the Lord. Number two, he says that because he knows the tendency that we often have is just to ignore the issue. And ignoring the issue does not solve the problem, right? Ignoring the issue does not solve the problem. The second thing I want to encourage you with, oh, by the way, Ephesians 4.26, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, 
right? Before the day ends, make sure that you have resolved the problem. The second thing I want to encourage you with today is handle it face to face. Handle it face to face. Can I give you a piece of advice that is so simple you're going to think it's stupid? I'm going to anyway, but just say yes, just for fun, okay? Hey, do not resolve conflict over text, okay? You know what I'm talking about? Don't handle conflict over uh, email. Don't handle it over text because, listen, text messages are hard enough to understand in the first place. You're like, you text LOL. Well, what, 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 what does that mean? You know, or, I mean, we know what that means, but, you know, you text a phrase and, you know, you get the general idea, but you don't know the heart behind it. And because this is an issue that we have, it's a problem that needed to be solved, now you have 10,000 emojis that you can select that convey what your heart is, right? Because people have a question. Well, what, what do you do? You send a little face that's got two hearts for eyeballs, and that means that you love or whatever. Or you send a face that, you know, it's all a frown, which means I hate your guts or whatever. But because text messaging, it's so hard to really interpret the motivation of an individual's heart, it is the worst possible way that you can resolve conflict. No, handle it face to face. Go to that person. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 is like the classic section on how to handle or resolve conflict as Christians. I want to encourage you to read it. But Jesus says, man, if there's a brother who has an offense against you, go to him alone. Go to him alone. Don't gossip. Don't post the issue on social media. Don't get a little group of people together and say, hey, listen, man, you know what? There's a bro. We really need to pray for him. And just so you guys know how to pray, I want to tell you what's going on, right? And so you unload all of your stuff. Listen, stop it. Stop it. You don't care about that person. It's not about praying for them. It is about gossip, and it's about aligning people to yourself. You are preempting you know, the public exposure of the situation. And you're getting as many people on your possible side as you can so that when it uh, does go down, you've got your little team. That's not godly. That's not pleasing to God. That's not being obedient to the words of Christ. If you have an issue, Jesus says, no, you go to that person alone. Be courageous enough to deal with it face to face. Hey, listen, focus on bigger goals. The whole purpose here, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, is this. When you go to that brother, if there's that forgiveness and reconciliation you've gained, you've gained that brother. And the whole purpose of resolving conflict is not so that we win the argument. Amen. Right? I mean, how many times have you been in conflict in your marriage and you, you don't, you have no concern whatsoever about making things right. You just want to prove your point. And you've got your data, you've got your stats, you've got the past record of wrongs. Look, you can bring up stuff from 30 years ago that God doesn't even remember. And you know, because it's, it's stuck in your brain like a steel trap, and you know, you got such a great gift. I would encourage you to use it to memorize scripture <laughs> instead of memorizing people's faults, all right? You'll bless them, you'll bless God, and you'll bless me too, because it'll mean less counseling here at the church. Focus on bigger goals. Like you go into the, you go into the conflict uh, with the target of achieving what God wants to achieve. Believe the best. Man, this is so good. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, love thinks no evil. Love thinks no evil. Hey, don't assume that you know what's going on in someone else's heart. Don't just assume that. Don't put yourself in a position to know things that only God can know. You know how many times I've done this and gotten myself in trouble? You know, I'm not, I'm not the most passive person in the world. And so, I know, I know. I mean, there are times where I'm like, God, I know you said face to face, but I got so many issues, I don't want to deal with it. And God's like, no, you are going to deal with it. And you're going to deal with it in a way where you're thinking no evil of the individual. You're not assuming to know their motivation. I can't tell you how many times I've been, unfortunately, in the spot where I've seen behavior and activity, and I've thought, you know what, I know what's going on there, and I'm going to address this because I'm a pretty direct person, only to find out that I had completely misperceived the situation. Better to go into the conversation humble than to have to be humbled in the conversation, right? 
God knows. God knows. And so what do we do? We believe the best. We go in and we say something like this. Listen, uh, I just want to tell you how I perceive this. I want to tell you what I see. And I want to admit right now, I could be and I probably am totally wrong. But this is how I see this situation rolling out. That's a humble heart that God will always honor. Listen, own your part. Matthew chapter 5, verse 24. Own your part. The truth is this. It takes two to tango. When we do marriage counseling, we don't just counsel the wife alone or we don't just counsel the husband alone because we know that there are always two sides to a story. We know that there are always two people that are contributing to a problem. And if you're in a place where it's like the other person is always the problem, let me tell you, you are probably the one who is the problem. We go into conflict resolution looking, right? We're looking. We're looking for the revelation that comes from God to show us areas we ourselves may be at fault because we don't want to perpetuate it. We don't want to be the one instigating it. We don't want the the real issue to be that somebody else is triggered to respond in such a way. And I'm not saying they're not responsible for it, but they're triggered to respond such a way because we ourselves are in fact guilty. Be humble, own your part, explain, don't blame. Right? Don't go into it saying, hey, well, you're guilty of this and you're guilty of that. Uh, be, be able to express coherently and clearly what the issue is um, because the whole point is to solve the problem. And if you're just all full of emotion and anger and you're just about blaming the other person and you can't, can't even explain what it is that the problem really is, you'll never be able to solve that problem. Be willing to learn. I've I've kind of mentioned this, you know, just have that humble heart, that humble attitude that does want to learn from the Lord. And then the eighth thing is simply Matthew chapter 18, verse 16, get help. You know, there are some times where we just need other people to help us resolve a situation. Sometimes we need a third person to be a sounding board. You can get so, like, let's just talk about marriage for a second. You can get so confused in the situation that neither of you can see straight. And so it's good to go to a pastor or to a leader and to express the issue, to open up the scripture, and to have them objectively guide you. The goal in resolving conflict is reconciling hearts, not winning the argument. The second thing is this, and this will go pretty quick, remember that God is the God of now. The second thing is remember that God is the God of now. God was in, I love how merciful he is, because he knew what Cain was going to do. God was in Cain's life, helping him and seeking to guide him. You know, it wasn't that Cain had a relationship with God through his parents, right? That's not how it works. He is the God of Abraham. He is the God of Isaac. He is the God of Jacob. Jacob did not have a relationship with God vicariously through his grandfather Abraham. God is the God of the living. God is the God of your present. God is involved in your life today. Listen, why is that so important? Because you need to be engaging God in a present way. Hey, maybe the issue for you is your past. It's past failure. Or maybe you have deep wounds that have happened to you over the course of your life. Or maybe you've been unable to overcome sin, so there's a history of temptation that you uh, fail to respond to the right way over and over. Listen, maybe it's just your history. Maybe it's just your past. Your past is like a chain that is holding you back. I want to remind you that God is the God of your present. How do you handle your past? By experiencing God in your present. How do you deal with yesterday? By walking with God today. This is one of my go-to verses. Like if you ever come to me with an issue, most likely over the course of time, you'll get this verse, Isaiah 26, 3 to 4. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now check this admonition, this exhortation out. Trust in the Lord forever. Right? Not just, not just a moment in your past, but from this point on and through the rest of your life, make the decision. Choose to trust in God forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Look, I, when you look backwards, I don't know what it is that you deal with, but I know the one who is in your present, and I know he is the one who is able to help you. 
He is the one who can break the chains of the past. He is the one who can bring healing to your heart today. He is the one who can enable you to overcome those areas of sin and temptation that you consistently struggle with. The God of the present is able to move in your life today. Now, with respect to this, let me just encourage you in your relationships to foster an atmosphere of forgiveness, okay? Foster an atmosphere of forgiveness. Um, You know, I think oftentimes it is unforgiveness that keeps us chained to the past, Okay? And I just, wanna, I, just want to, I just want to let that sink in for a second, you know, because, because inevitably there are some of us who just, you know, there are things we have chosen not to forgive people for. And, you know, I, I think there can be just in a, a really, you know, hard, you know how our flesh is. When we hold a grudge, it can make us feel good. I mean, how fleshly is that, Right? When we're unforgiving, we feel like we're, we've been hurt, we've been wounded. And so in a way, when, we, when we're unforgiving, we're wounding that person back while we're not even realizing that we're chaining ourselves to the past. Now, I don't know how you roll. I don't know what your family is like, but, but is it an atmosphere of grudge holding? It is, is it an atmosphere of bitterness? It is, is it an atmosphere of unforgiveness? I want, to, I want you to listen to me today. Even the world knows that's not good. Even the world knows unforgiveness is not good. I was researching this in the Huffington Post. Even the Huffington Post knows that unforgiveness is not good. Let me read to you what they wrote about forgiveness. Forgiveness transforms anger and hurt into healing and peace, they said. Forgiveness can help you overcome feelings of depression, anxiety, and rage, as well as personal and relational conflicts. It is about making the conscious decision to let go of a grudge. That's the world. That's, and the truth is, this is not always the case, but sometimes our anxiety, our depression, our rage is connected to unforgiveness in our life. And this is the best the world can do. All the world can say is, hey, let it go. Let it go. Just, hey, just drop it. Just drop it. Let me tell you something. Without Christ, you will not be able to drop it. You can't just let it go. You can repress it. You can try to sweep it under the carpet, but we have something so much more as Christians. We have the cross of Christ. Look, we bring the issue. We bring the offense. We've been sincerely wounded. Maybe we've gone through abuse. We can come to the cross of Christ, and number one, we can receive for the things we've done, the fullness of God's forgiveness. And you know what he does? And when you receive his forgiveness, he heals your heart. He lifts the burden. He transforms and changes you. And then he fills you with the capacity to extend that same forgiveness to other people. Forgiveness. <laughs> forgiveness is not self-generated. Forgiveness is God-generated. When you forgive somebody, you're just giving to them what God has given to you. And listen, when you're living in chronic unforgiveness, let me just say this as a Christian, it means that not only is there a problem here, but there's a problem here. Okay, not only is there a problem here, but there's a problem in your relationship with God. You know, because it's not just a matter of Letting it go, I mean, it is a matter of letting it go. It's a matter of choosing, making the choice in light of all that God has done for us to give to others what he has given to us. Don't let yesterday's chains hold you or your family back from today or tomorrow's blessings. And listen to this, move on today by forgiving the offenses of yesterday. The third thing here, and we're wrapping up, is take the off-ramp. And and he says this, right? He says this to Cain. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and his desire is for you, but you should rule over it. The the third thing that God instructs Cain with is this. Hey, Cain, there's an option. There is an option. Take the off-ramp. Make the right decision. There's always a way of escape. You know, for Cain, it was, it was a big choice because ultimately it would lead to murder. But our choices aren't always that big. And you know what? If we're going to make the big choices right, we have to make the little choices right. Small decisions matter in your life. 
Small decisions matter in your life. In fact, it's the small decisions, you know, that you make over the course of time that lay the foundation for you to make the right decision when it's the big decision. It's being faithful with the little things so that you can be faithful with the bigger things. He says to Cain, hey, you need to choose the right thing. You need to to evaluate the higher value. And we do this, I think, in a positive way when we make small decisions that have an impact not only in our lives, but also for generations to come, maybe. Unhealthy generational patterns are broken by taking small steps of of obedience over and over and over again. This is great news for us today. We can establish new patterns in our life. With God's strength, with God's help, there can be new patterns that we establish, not just for ourselves, but maybe even for generations to come. I'm not a neuroscientist, obviously, but there's something called neuroplasticity, Your brain has the ability to rewire itself. You know, when there's trauma to a brain and it affects your uh, mobility or maybe, you know, your thinking, your your brain can rewire the neurons to, to circumvent that area of trauma and to reconnect in a way where you can, over the course of time in therapy, have that mobility restored or have the capacity to think or to, to speak restored. And when you make small decisions in your life over and over and over again, I'm saying to you, it has a physiological effect even on your mind. There are spiritual implications. There are physical implications as well. You know, the the word he uses uh, when he says rule over sin is very strong. It means to take it by force. It means to assault it, right? I mean, there was, it was a military term when a soldier would take a, a, a fortification. It's not passive. It's not just letting it, you know, happen. God is saying sin is lying at the door. It wants, it wants to, its desire is for you, but Cain, what you need to do is you need to take it by force. You need to aggressively deal with it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, God always provides for us the off-ramp. We're never in a situation where we can say to God, hey, God, you know what? I had no choice but to sin. No, that's not the case. There is always a way out. You know, with respect to this, I want to encourage you to make sure you're establishing healthy boundaries in your relationships, right? Don't put yourself in a place where where you are in an unhealthy, toxic relationship environment. You say, well, what does that look like? When you, in your relationship, don't have the capacity to say no, that is unhealthy. When you're in a relationship and the other person always refuses to take to take responsibility for anything that is a toxic situation. When you're in a relationship where there's not mutual respect being developed or you can't communicate times where you feel uncomfortable about something, maybe in a relationship where someone is coercing you or pushing you to do something that you know is not right but you feel trapped, you know, and to the extent where it's like, man, I want to say something, but I'm just so afraid to say something, that is a toxic environment, and you need to establish healthy boundaries so you're not trapped in that type of situation. The final thing today is this, and this is just going to be super quick, choose to live in his victory. Choose to live in the victory of Jesus. You know, the authority of Christ overrides every other authority in your life. Do you know that today? Sometimes, sometimes I do think we give credence or we give credit to things in an excessive way to the extent where it's like, well, you know what, this, I just have this desire in my life. You know, this is just the way it is. I'm stuck with it for the rest of my life. Listen, if that's your attitude, what you're saying is that desire that you have has greater authority than the authority of Jesus in your life. And that's not true. Or, you know, you're dealing with somebody in a relationship and man, they're a strong person. They have a strong personality. You know, and they just, they just come on in such an overwhelming way, and you always live in this place where you feel like the victim. That person does not have greater authority in your life than Jesus Christ has in your life. 
Or, you know, maybe you're looking at the adversary and it's the devil this and it's the devil that. And you guys know, I mean, he is, a, he is not an adversary to be trifled with, but he's not Jesus. He is not the equal opposite of Jesus Christ. You don't go out these doors thinking, oh my gosh, what, what's the devil going to do to me now? And you're just consumed and paranoid about the next trick that he's going to deploy. Listen, get your eyes off of the devil and get your eyes onto Jesus Christ. He is the one. He, he is the one who has authority in, as a Christian. He is the one who has authority over all things in your life. And his authority overrides everything else. It's not just a matter of declaring it. I know sometimes in the house of God, I can say, hey, you know, speak the authority of Jesus' name over you. And you know what? It's a good thing to do because there's power in his name. But don't just speak it, live it. Don't just speak it, live it. Don't just say it out loud and then, and then in a spiritual sense, live cowardly for the other six days of the week, walk in the power, the supernatural power that he has supplied through his name. You are not a victim. I'm not saying that you've never been victimized in your life, but that victimization does not define you. It's not all about what they did or what you know, he did or the, the man did or the business did or the government did. No, listen, it's about what Jesus has done in your life. You're not a victim, you're a victor. <laughs> Instead of being overcome this week, be an overcomer. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Lord, we love you and we thank you today for just the, the word of exhortation. And there's a lot, I know, there's a lot to really apply and to bring into our lives. I pray today that you would help us. We can ask for help. God, your word has declared that. And for all those hearts today that are going to be vulnerable enough and transparent enough with you to say, God, help me. We pray today that because of your great love, you would do exceedingly abundantly above all. God, do a new work, do a fresh work, do a reviving work. Break chains today, start new patterns. God, that would influence generations to come for your gospel, for your glory. Heal hearts, we pray today. God, get relationships right today. This morning, we're going to end this service a little differently, and, and um, just really, we really do want to provide an opportunity today for you to hand that need that you have over to the Lord. He is present to help you. You can trust in Yahweh because in him is everlasting strength. Whatever need you have this morning, uh, we, want, we want to pray. I want to lead you in prayer today or I want to pray for you today. And I'm going to ask you, if you have a need to bring to God, would you just stand up right now? Just, just stand. Maybe it's a relationship need. Hey, maybe you find yourself in the place of kind of the perpetrator. You know, there have been... Uh, patterns of behavior in your, in your life that are just, they've not been good and you need God's help. I want you to stand today. Maybe you've been on the receiving end. Maybe you've been hurt. You've been wounded. There is maybe deep victimization in your life and you need the power of Christ to heal your heart. Stand today. Maybe there's been grudges and unforgiveness in your life, things you've held on to, and look, you've not even connected the dots. You don't even realize that some of the current struggles that you have are connected to this, this unforgiveness that you've been bearing. Hey, it's been holding you back. It's been hurting you. And you need to trust God with it today. Stand this morning and give it to him. Let his forgiveness fill your heart and flow through you. 
Maybe there's been uh, strong temptations in your life and, and you might be at a crossroads today. There's uh, decisions for you to make and, and you need to choose the right decision. You need to make the right decision. You need to choose the right path. You need to do what honors God. You need a strength to do it. Stand today. God bless you. Just grateful. I just want to wait for just a moment because I know that we sometimes need space, some time. You can stand today because he loves you. God bless you. Grateful for all of you who are standing. Maybe today you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and the need that you have is salvation. Would you stand this morning and confess that to him? Maybe you have a, a saved spouse and, and you've just been reluctant. You know, you've dug your heels in, but you, you need to decide. You need to choose Christ once and for all. God bless you guys. Father, thank you. God, we bless your name. We're just so grateful for these open hearts. We know that this is what you're waiting for. God, you're waiting for us to hand the burden over to you, God, to, to give to you what we've been holding on to and maybe clinging with, uh, we've been struggling with, we've been trying to fix ourselves. And God, thank you today that there are needs that are being lifted up to you. God, we do give you these needs today. We pray, God, that you would miraculously work in each of these lives. Father, you know exactly what is needed and we pray that you would supply in great measure healing and forgiveness and hope. God, that you would restore joy. God, that there would be a work in relationships where there's been, been division. We pray that you would bring unity God, where there's discouragement and, 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 Lord, maybe even depression, we pray that you would lift these souls, that the cloud would be parted and your light would shine. Father, we pray for a new work, not only in these lives, but, God, in these families that are represented that, that would have an impact to the third and to the fourth generation. We thank you, Father, that you are present with us today. We trust you with all of our hearts, we give you these needs and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would meet them exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Hey, let's all stand today. We're going to close in worship. God bless you. Have an awesome week.